Allora, insomma sono abbastanza emozionato perché, perché Gabriele Lavia è un grande artista italiano e al meeting per la prima volta, grazie a Luciano Violante che ha creato questo, questo ciclo Esseri Italiani e l'incontro di oggi si chiama incontrare il genio artistico e Gabriele Lavia questo è da molti anni nel nostro paese. Eh, ma è anche un italiano vero, da un certo punto di vista è un italiano esemplare, scusate la citazione di Cutugno, ma ehm, è nato a Milano, stranamente, è nato a Milano però è di famiglia catanese, poi la famiglia si è trasferita a Torino, poi ci sarebbe stata anche addirittura un'eventuale deviazione verso New York, ma poi non si è fatta perché suo papà, come racconta Lavia, ha scelto Torino, ha fatto la scuola, <ride> è perché ci sono i filmati, poi sembra che, sembra che mi monto la testa, capisci? <ride> è durata meno di un'ora <ride> la mia avventura, va bene. <ride> anni di scuola a Torino, poi gli studi li ha fatti a Roma, quelli attorali voglio dire, e da 50 anni è, è come dire, uno zingaro per tutti i grandi teatri italiani, è stato direttore di teatri stabili a Torino, a Roma, oggi lo è a Firenze, e è stato un giovane attore diretto da Streller, da Patroni Griffi, da Giancarlo Sbragia, da Squarzina, Missiroli, Sciaccalughe e quasi tutti gli altri, poi è diventato un mattatore, come si dice, un capocomico, un regista di teatro, di cinema, di teatro d'opera. Ha fatto poca televisione, ha fatto molto cinema come attore e anche un po' come regista e oggi è semplicemente nel nostro paese un maestro, un punto di riferimento, un creatore di, di spettacoli e un interprete molto amato dal pubblico e questo... Quelli della mia generazione secondo me lo capiscono, cioè è una voce Gabriele Lavia. Io ho trovato un frammentino in cui tanti anni fa Ilario Occhini eh, fa questa osservazione. Vedo entrare Gabriele Lavia, un ragazzino, si mette a sedere e brum, un vocione pazzesco. <ride> Ilaria. Ilaria Occhini questo. È una cara amica. E Gabriele Lavia è uno stile nel teatro italiano. Allora, eh, io chiederei la prima foto, perché il nostro percorso di stasera va attraverso alcune fotografie. Eccolo qua. È una foto legata alla televisione, mi ha spiegato prima il maestro, però... Io vorrei... Si doveva essere, siccome è come si dice in gergo in abiti moderni, des, desumo che sia un vivere insieme, ne ho fatti diversi, Quindi... ero sempre un ragazzo disadattato, <ride> Televisione e per dei... questo mi prendevano, perché avevo, unicamente perché avevo i capelli lunghi, <ride> allora capello lungo, trattino, disadattato è in conflitto col mondo e quindi col padre, con la madre, eh, genitori separati, difficili. Una volta mi ricordo che rubai a un benzinaio, sì sì, rubai a un benzinaio nella fiction, ah, allora però non si chiamava fiction, era bello perché si chiamava originale televisivo. Era una specie di televisione un po' originale, nel senso che era in abiti... Qui c'è una camicia jeans, la televisione era, era avanti, avanti eh. esatto. qui c'è il jeans. Scusa, eh, la foto 2, eh, volevo controllare se è in jeans anche quella, vediamo la foto 2. È due. probabile. Foto 2, ecco. Eh, altro vivere insieme. Ecco. Mm. I believe that here I cut my hair during the winter because I had to play in theater. My hair was uh, growing. Okay, let's start from there.
This is uh, young Lavia, growing up in the 1950s and 60s. How were choices made? What was the situation like at that time in Italy when you were very young? Well, Italy was uh, totally different from uh, what it is now. So much different that it is almost impossible to say what Italy was like at that time. I'll give an example. I told my father that uh, he was, he was very tall, he was uh, uh, taller than two meters. Uh, well, I look like my mother, actually, as you can see. I was born in Milan by mistake because um, my father, on the Albanian front, after a night that he spent in a march, uh, took the amoeba. So, from the front, it was sent to Milan to look to, to take care of him, and uh, it was not uh, fighting on the front, but uh, he was on the retreat. So, uh, he was uh, doing his military service, but he was sitting down. If he stood up, it was it, it, it was a problem. So it was a sitting military service, so to speak. This is the way they used to call it. So my mother uh, knew that uh, my father was there. So she had two children with her. She went to Milan. But uh, that was uh, 1942, and there was no high-speed train at that time. So she went to Milan. My father... Uh, in the meantime, had recovered. And uh, Gabrielino was uh, conceived at that time. And when he was born, uh, Milan was being bombed. So my father from the barracks uh, went to our house in uh, Via Farini. So he ran through uh, uh, Viale Manzoni, there was a major street in Milan, and uh, he used to tell me about this horror of the war, because it was his nightmare. Um, so they're bombing Milan, oh my God, he was saying, they're bombing uh, the house where we live. So he ran to the house uh, through uh, the stairs, and it was crazy, it was crazy. He didn't dare to uh, turn around. There was uh, somebody else running the opposite way. He was running. There were uh, airplanes that were flying very low, and they were bombing. Man's horror has no limits. I'm a bit against the title of this meeting, I have to say. My father uh, saw this image until the end of his life. Uh, he was running uh, and uh, uh, the bombing uh, threw his head away and he continued to run for three or four steps. And he saw, my father saw this image, it was a terrible image. And my father never forgot about this image. So there was the bombing, uh, my mother took us all, and we had to flee away near Milan in a village called the Cassano Valcunia. Uh, uh, my grandmother was in Sicily at the time, she was a teacher, and she knew that uh, uh, her daughter and her grandchildren were totally lost in some village of the north of Italy, and I don't know how. Just like the Pennines to the Andes, she crossed Italy from Sicily and she came to Cassano Valcuria, where we were. Everybody was displaced, uh, even the kids. Uh, so my grandmother was uh, a teacher, so uh, she took a barn and she made a school for all the kids. This is life.
this is life uh, that we would have never imagined. Oh, come on, we, we were a bit against our granny, but uh, uh, they had, uh, our grand grandparents had crossed the world that we can even imagine. Uh, we've led a very comfy life, I have to say, maybe angry, but not a tragic li life like they did. However, in my family, uh, my family was uh, never rich. There were four kids. So there was a sort of uh, bit of hope, still a hope. And when I decided to become an actor, uh, my uh, uh, father was uh, blessed, uh, injured to death. And so now we come to this picture, number three. Sino Bozzelli, this is uh, uh, Galileo's Life by Brecht. This is Piccolo Teatro in Milan in 1963. I read in some uh, interviews that Lavia said, I was in Turin. I uh, remember a bus uh, that we used to take to go to Milan. We were full of enthusiasm. It was like a pilgrimage for us to watch Galileo by Strehler. Yes, the bus was organized by Fiero Fassini, um, uh, who was a part of the University Theatre Center in uh, uh, Turin. Sometimes we meet. Uh, and we talk about that episode together. Let me remind you something uh, about Fasino. I, I was deeply moved by that. A few years ago, I played uh, Galileo and I went to uh, Turin. So the premiere was uh, the day of my birthday uh, and uh, the mayor gave me a gift. a small shape of the Molle Antonelliana, which is a symbol of Turin, that was really much appreciated. And it perfectly recalled that episode of the bus of Turin, that we, uh, we uh, went back to Turin after watching this show that was very long, the theater play very, very long. It was the premiere, so Strehler had to cut some of the scenes. Some people said say that it finished at like uh, two at night. Yes, I saw I saw this show about twelve times. I think uh, the last time it was at the Eliseo Theatre in Rome. So it it was only staged on in Milan and then in Rome. Yes, twelve times uh, I went to see this play. Tino, Tino Bozzelli. Uh, it was a wonderful person. I was very poor. And he was telling me, ah, come on, let's go to dinner. Let's go and drink. Don't worry, don't worry. Tino's going to pay for you. He was very, very kind. He was a great player. Paolo Grassi no longer paid him uh, because uh, he was uh, playing at the casino. What was the meaning of uh, going to uh, uh, going on a pilgrimage to see the symbol of the layman culture, so to speak? Uh, to tell you the truth, it's not that when I go to theater, I think whether it's a religious play or a Muslim play or a layman play. I, I'm, I'm just uh, watching the show, if I like it or not, if it's beautiful or not. And if the show is beautiful, if the show is beautiful, you don't realize. You just get grabbed by it. Uh, nobody knows, knows what the theater is, but everybody can recognize it. This is just like love. Have you fallen in love and you don't know what love is? No. Theater is a, comes from teatron, uh, the goddess place. Uh, goddess means look, 
female look, Teion, Teaumari, uh, attending to. It is a look, it is a look, it is what you see, which is looking at you. You don't have to think about the Christian or the Jewish God up there in the sky. The Greek gods, the gods of the theater, um, are at the same level as your eyes. You look down and you have the God of the floor looking at you. You can see the floor, but uh, there's something looking at you whereby you can say, you are a floor. You can see a show, and that show is looking at you, and uh, you have the theater, the goddess. Uh, what is the goddess of theater? A Leteia, the one unveiling the plot. In Latin, it is translated into veritas. The Latins couldn't translate Greek because veritas comes from verum. Verum means barrier. The verum uh, was the soldier's condition. It's a soldier standing and being a barrier uh, against the falsum uh, from fallere, fallen. The concept of uh, uh, Roman truth unlike the Greek truth, is that the truth belongs to the winner. And uh, the fallen is a falsum. You've lost. You have to stand. For the Greeks, a leteia is unveiling what? Unveiling lete, leton, veil. Everything is veiled. Everything is veiled. We are surrounded by uh, mystery, and mystery is made up of uh, looks watching at you, and uh, those looks are called theoi. Greeks have no theology, no religion. They have a worship, a culture. which didn't last long, but it was uh, the great salvation of humankind. Sorry, Father, I know that for you salvation is something else, so I apologize for that, but without the Greeks, uh, it wouldn't have been possible. The Greeks came before us. I really like this difference between the true and the false uh, that you mentioned. So the meeting, uh, uh, the meeting started off from the great intuition uh, by Giussani in 1954, and uh, uh, this is uh, uh, at the heart of this meeting. In 1963, uh, Milan, the city of Milan, uh, totally went against this show. There was uh, a, a, a battle uh, made by the GS people at that time against the uh, monopoly of university students, uh, as in uh, the deans uh, and of faculties and some students, uh, or uh, the deans of schools and students, uh, wanted uh, to have just one association in every school. Uh, the GS people were uh, uh, Christians, uh, inside the school, and they said, no, we just don't want one association, we want several associations. What has it got to do with Piccolo Teatro? Well, it is connected to that because they were promoting the culture of theater, and Paolo Grassi, don't, don't give us this picture because you're anticipating what I'm about to say, Now, as I was saying, uh, Paolo Grassi, together with Treller, in 1948, uh, created the uh, Piccolo Teatro in Milan, a theater. And uh, in the schools in Milan, uh, there was a sort of cultural monopoly. From then, uh, there was uh, a heated battle in the uh, uh, early 1960s. And uh, when Galileo uh, was put on stage as a show, everything was wonderful. It was beautiful. It was not ideology. 
But there was something that was very interesting. Paolo Grassi in Milan. Uh, organized events uh, in a Turati Circle, which was an old uh, communist club. Uh, so Paolo Grassi, creator of uh, uh, Piccolo Teatro, having a dialogue uh, with uh, young people of 15, 20 years of age, uh, and discussed uh, 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 cultural policy with him. And think about today's Italy. Now, talking about uh, Galileo and the image of the church inside Brecht, it makes us laugh. Those were strong battles. Uh, Cardinal Pupardo in 1992 said that the condemnation of 1633 against Galileo was unfair. And it was a mix of theology and cosmology, which was old fashioned. That was the Catholic uh, Church in uh, 1992, something that has totally disappeared. However, Italy at that time used the theater to have an exchange, to talk, to have a dialogue. But Paolo Grassi talking to the students. If you read the newspapers, the articles, and Paolo Grassi's letters on this exchange, Italy was totally different from the one we have right now. Am I right or wrong? Well, actually, Paolo Grassi was a wonderful person. I was very young. Uh, when I worked with uh, Strehler and uh, uh, Paolo Grassi uh, used to come over, although uh, uh, he, it was, uh, he, he, had just, he had already become a superintendent at the Scala in Milan. But in any case, uh, uh, he always came over to uh, pop in in uh, Rovello. Uh, Grassi was always there. And he really liked me. I was nobody at the time. Gee, I love you, he used to tell me. You are the young hope of Italian socialism, he used to tell me. But I'm not a socialist. Well, your business. Now. When I, when I first uh, uh, worked as a director, Paolo Grassi watched all my shows. The next day, I would receive a very long letter by him. Dear Lavia, he used to write me, your show is uh, uh, not worthy. I'm really very proud uh, of you. Uh, let me give you some remarks. One, two, three, 22, 65. Four or five pages of remarks, of notes, uh, that were so deep, so detailed. And I used to answer, dear Paolo, you are right. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, uh, you know that uh, a director can never end this direction. However, I was very hurt by the fact that uh, you understood uh, all that uh, didn't work uh, in the show. And I still keep some of his letters. And uh, there was no premiere. just to tell you the human dimension and the human quality of that person, there was no premiere of my show without having Paolo Grassi and Giorgio Streller sending me a telegram or a note or a letter. And I keep the last note sent me by Giorgio Streller, and I know it by heart. He was in Vienna at that time, 
he died one year later. Uh, I don't know. I was in a show on a, the Lyrico Theatre in Milan, and he sent me a fax where uh, he wrote me, Dear Gabriele, we have uh, an old and uh, intact, full affection. In the meantime, our Hamlet is still waiting. Full stop, but not for a long time, exclamation mark. Yours, Giorgio. And who was I at that time? So they were not writing to a great director or a great actor. They were writing to somebody who was like them because they thought that theatre was a sort of brotherhood. Sometimes uh, I saw trailers stopping the rehearsals to show uh, a, 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 a painting or something. And uh, it was very rhetorical. And uh, uh, he was, uh, uh, he used to congratulate uh, uh, the uh, machine operator that used to make the paintings. There were uh, eight people working with him at that time. Not 800. There, there were just eight of them. So that was the artistic brotherhood, and that was just the embodiment of the community theatre, a public theatre. In today's Italy, we know that we have a permanent theatres in our cities, but uh, uh, we don't know uh, what the story, what is the story behind it. And the story uh, started in 1948 in this small uh, uh, theatre in Milan because Streller and Grassi said that we, we no longer want to, it's not enough to have a private theatre company or a, a private theatre. We want to have a, a community theatre. Uh, where we can have uh, uh, artistic plays uh, to the service of the community as a whole. And before we talked about uh, uh, layman's culture, um, and uh, the Piccolo Theatre, uh, and uh, this was also stated by my Master of Journalism, Mr. Bertani, Eduardo, that, that maybe you have met, he always told me that uh, uh, the first night uh, that uh, Piccolo Teatro uh, was opened in 1948, there was a great Catholic intellectual, Mario Pollonio, who wrote the text uh, for the first show in Piccolo Teatro. This is what Bertani used to say. So, you have uh, this uh, idea of a theatre which is like a nourishment. That was 1948, uh, after the, uh, uh, the city of Milan that you have just described, where you were born. Uh, is that dream still alive? You, as an actor, as a theatre actor, do you still have the same idea of the theatre? No, the theatre has pretty much changed, I have to say. Also, uh, uh, the relation between the theatre and politics uh, has changed, or rather, not the relation with politics, but uh, the relation between theatre and red tape, bureaucracy, has changed. Bureaucracy has killed the theatre. As simple as that. When I started uh, to work in theatre, it, 
a theater season would be 150 plays, which means a plane for about seven months, 150 shows in a row. Today, there's about 20, 22 plays in a row. Twenty twenty two performances. I will soon go to Genoa uh, to play uh, Ian Gabriel, Gabriel Gorkman by Ibsen. There will be, I think, about two, 22 performances. Too many people working there. Either you pay the people working for the theater or you pay the theater. That's the main problem. So, the theatre was killed. Is that because the community no longer needs an artistic theatre and to feed on theatre? No, it's not that. The theatre is so difficult that uh, it, the result is always poor. Apart from a few exceptions. Giorgio was an exception to that, but he also had some performances that, that were not very good. They were uh, ugly shows, uh, uh, but uh, ugly in terms of Giorgio's trailer, not in terms of anyone. There was no audience. Uh, there were fewer people. Uh, when he played Gene, for example, he was suffering. And uh, I went to see him, and he told me, why, why have I done it? Uh, because they have convinced me to do it, I didn't want to do it. He was cursing, he was really cursing, but that was his own way to pray. He was praying the God of theater. God knows who is Dionysus, maybe. You didn't ask. You didn't answer my question. Uh, maybe the community no longer needs it. No, no, it's not that the community and Italy does need the theater, because what is the theater? At the end of the day, the theater is the representation of the man and of the fact of being a man. If there's a good actor, if the show is successful, if the actors, if the audience is a good audience, then in between the audience and the show, man looks at a representation and uh, can uh, nurture his human dimension. Now you're silent. Now in this silence, uh, uh, you're not listening to me. You are listening to somebody else. As in, you're listening to yourselves. You are listening to me as if I were you, because I am you. You are listening to your other self. This is the uh, great invention of the theater, this place of the goddess, this place of Alites Kene, uh, the hiding place, Prosopon, the mask which is put on your face to hide something. The ho all the hiding, uh, the hiding, which is at the heart of the theater, what is its purpose? If not uh, uh, for the audience to unveil it, uh, to take off this mask, the curtains, Aulaia. 
it was black. The curtains in the Greek theater uh, were raised by uh, two black cranes. Then Sophocles died. He was playing Euripides. And the curtains changed their color. They turned red, just like a deepest blood. Sophocles says that the blood coming out of a deepest eyes is a sort of veil. Hiding uh, Oedipus from the representation of the false, which is the world. And it is put in direct contact uh, with an inner eye, with another truth. So it is a mix of red and black, uh, which becomes the, which becomes the color of the curtains from then on although some architects turn the curtains into a yellow blue something i also saw curtains that had flowers on them i think in rimini many years ago now I'm old and the old people speak too much. I, I, I feel totally useless here. So I would go away, but I'm going to stay here. Picture number seven. This man is very little known in Italy, but is a sort of miracle. His name is Oranio, Orazio sorry, Costa Giovancini. Since 1944, up to the end of the 1990s, trained all the major Italian actors. I jotted down a few of them. Nino Manfredi, Paolo Panelli, Rossella Fag, Gianrico Tedeschi, Anna Miserocchi, Lario Chini, Franco Graziosi, Glauco Mauri, Enrico Maria Salerno, Luca Ronconi, Anna Proclem, Roberto Erditzka, and... Fabrizio Gifuni, Luigi Locascio, and Pier Francesco Favino. This is Orazio Costa Giovancigli. He was a great master, a uh, great uh, uh, theater trainer. Uh, he trained a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of actors, and he was also a great director. Why was he so special? Because I don't know whether in Europe or worldwide uh, there is uh, such a continuity in actors' training. Who was he? <laughs> Orazio was an extraordinary man. With all its flaws. How can I put it? He was always going against the trends. This is why he died poor in the end. At the end of his will, he wrote a sentence that you have with you which was written by him. I don't know whether you can read it. It's a, a writing uh, which uh, uh, you can find uh, when uh, you uh, enter uh, the uh, uh, theater of La Pergola uh, that was managed by ETI. And uh, uh, the uh, ETI had uh, uh, given for free the room that was just on top of the uh, uh, theater, uh, on top of the roof of the, of the theater. Uh, 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 then uh, there, were also some, uh, there were also stairs for him that were built when he was old. And there's this plate. 
just listen to the words. These, these, these are words targeting actors. Words written for actors. Maybe it's too long. No, but it's very beautiful. It's very peculiar. If you know that your tool is yourself, first of all, you know your tool. You are aware that this is the same tool as the one dancing, singing, inventing words and creating feelings. But take care of it, just like an athlete, a singer, an acrobat, uh, feed it with your food continuously and uh, give it strength. Make it full of uh, uh, poetry, song, poetry and poetry again. You will become uh, an endless poetry, a continuous metamorphosis uh, of the I. You will be determined. You will be able to do everything. You will be able to uh, uh, feel a passion, feel affection, and you'll be enriched by that. And you'll be purified by that. You'll be tense at the revelation of what man is. An angel, an angel of the word. An acrobat of the spirits. A dancer of the mind, a God messenger, uh, nuncio to himself uh, and uh, to a better universe. Now, uh, it's a very ambitious sentence and it's a very deep one. Uh, it's very powerful in philosophical terms. When he talks about uh, uh, the mind, uh, he talks about the psyche. When he talks about the blow, he talks about uh, psyche, which means blow, breath. But the blow, breath, that can uh, tell the word, which to the Greeks uh, is tson, logon, epon. As in... The living, uh, echoing words. It's hard to translate. <laughs> well, one would wonder, this was a Christian, he was a believer. Well, yes, he was a believer, but a late believer. He was converted. Yes, he had the first communion when he was 47 years of age. But he sees uh, the actor as God's messenger explicitly, well, but in a pagan sense, truly in a pagan sense. Well, in a pagan sense because theater is pagan. There is uh, not Jewish Christian theater. Theater has its origin we don't know really when in some old and archaic tribe and primitive tribe when at a certain point a man by mistake represented himself in his double dimension. Possibly he gave representation of himself and the different side of himself that wanted to kill him. Fatto questo forse. Finché having done this, one day, tired, he had no strength to do this. You you know it. You saw it so many times. Please come and play the role of the bear. He didn't know, it's written nowhere, but it's obvious that's how it went. 
that's when from one person it was two person and then it got to three and then eleven people just having double roles as in Shakespeare and then 20, 30, 40 actors in the shows by Australia and my shows, oh my god, it was so frightening, so many actors I'm not sure whether Orazio Costa would agree on the idea of a pagan theater. Maybe he would say human one. No, no, no. Look, it's pagan. It's written here. But it doesn't mean that it really didn't care of uh, Jesus. It, it's pagan in the sense that, well, he tried after 47 years to uh, do a religious theater. In fact, he was not that successful. No. Theatre is originated against gods. Theatre is against gods. Oedipus is blinded because he went against gods. And this is knowledge. Prometheus is tied, but he gave the fire. It is something else. The other is human. It is human. As soon as there is the saints and Jesus and the Virgin Mary, it gets boring because there is a hope, there is faith, there is an arrival. Whereas men never get to the finishing line. Well, I said human. I actually said human, but faith and theater, well, wait, wait, you can't really mix them together. It does not mean that a theater person cannot be a faithful or a doubt. Well, listen, is there any case of a theater trainer that uh, was able to touch so many generations in Europe? I was impressed. No, I don't believe there is anybody else like him. He is an absolute genius, even if he made mistakes, just like everybody else. At a certain stage, he was obsessed. He was obsessed with the idea that the body of the actor had to match the image to which the word logos was hinting at. He made a philosophical mistake. Well, to keep it brief, he asked his actors to uh, do some drills. He was a wonderful actor. We were really um, enthusiastic and uh, amazed when he was uh, playing and he was showing how to perform a certain role. Streller was not like him. Streller was different. His idea was that the body of the actor was sort of water. But the water sometimes turns into a storm or the tree. The sun, the moon. So eventually, One day he told me, perhaps the end point of any mimesis is immobility. At a certain stage he had a doubt. Horatius is a philosopher. You realize that, considering what he writes.
your tool is yourself. That's what Horace says. He's saying that being an actor and probably the human being is never one. It is always double. It's two subjects fighting against each other. Armos in Greek, from which harmony. So he's talking about her Heraclitus, and he knows it. It's not just by chance. He's talking about the harmony of the double in oneself. This statement is so deep. Well, you haven't known Horace, his culture. Well, this evening we really learned something looking at you. Well, well beyond that, well beyond that. And obviously, he was misunderstood. Well, there's an exception. There is one exception, Paolo Grassi and Giorgio Strader. I would like now to quote a great uh, Italian uh, writer, Mr. Testori, who was a friend of the meeting, who wrote some dreadful uh, statements about him. He wrote, the first Italian director was not Strela neither Visconti but Orazio Costa, the first and the greatest. I remember the six characters performed by Costa, and I can assure that this was a total and absolute event in the theater. But be careful, this is not by chance that with the growing of all the structures in the theater world, uh, from the state, from the municipalities, from the local communities, then Costa was set aside, was isolated, and uh, our country has the privilege to diminish uh, its own poets. So that confirms what you just mentioned. Well, he was very bad tempered. It was really, really difficult to get on well with Horace because he was known, he, I would go maestro, maestro, but he was saying that's how it has to be done. We can't really do things the way we want sometimes. So I want, aren't we going to play our performance? We have to do it. He was really difficult. He was not an easy person. You had to love him for good or for not. There's so many anecdotes. Well, let's now see two pictures that takes us elsewhere. Let's try to be lighter now. Picture number eight. And this is a little bit more interesting than picture number 10. There we go. The first one, these are two horror movies. Zeder by Pupi Avati, 1983, and this is uh, Inferno by Dario Argento, one of the many movies that you shot with Dario Argento from 1980, if I'm not wrong. Well, this uh, pierced uh, lavia is not bad. This is a fake, right? Well, of course. There is a kind of spring behind. Considering the lavia that uh, have been uh, described until now, what, why did you decide to do it? I told you a minute ago, I was uh, having a walk and I saw a movie set, I saw some movie tracks, and I saw Eleonora Giorgi, and I said hello to her, and I asked her, what are you doing? Oh, I'm, I'm shooting a movie with Dario, and I see Dario Argento, I say hello Dario, and he said, please, I, please, Gabriele, I have a huge, huge problem. It's just one pause, just this evening. 
Can you please do it? I said, all right, Dario. So his brother comes. Don't, don't worry, don't you worry. I'll talk about tomorrow with your manager. Don't you worry. So the scene was like this. Eleonora and I were going to uh, take the lift. There was this lift thing. And then Eleonora would go, please take me home. So I take her home because she's frightened. No, I was frightened to be raped in the lift. I even wrote to all the newspapers to say, oh my God. Well, you know. Then she takes me to her place, and she is pretty weird. She asks me to take, uh, to bring her a glass of water. I go next door, and uh, things seem to go well. And then I get back to her. And when I get back, I'm like this, and the scene is over, so she will cry all night long. And we were at a certain floor, and at that time, uh, we didn't use those facilities that are now used uh, when you know, people normally shoot uh, a night scene, but it's during the day. They do a sort of uh, hatch, a sort of uh, cover, and then they use filters, a blue filter, and so the night effect is obtained. If you want to exaggerate, you can even place uh, another light, uh, uh, another light in effect. But this was on an upper floor, so it was really necessary to shoot that scene at night time. And so this happened by chance. And then when I uh, was involved in Nono Sonno, I was the director of the Stable Theatre of Turin that was uh, at the Piazza Carignano. I was uh, leaving the office. I was about to leave the office, and uh, I was going to the bar to have a coffee. And as I was going downstairs, Dario Argento was going upstairs. So you always meet this way. Say, hi, oh my god, Dario, you're here. Oh, I'm shooting something. Well, we have our office upstairs, all right? So these days, maybe we can meet up and have a dinner together. And then he faces out of the window and say, Gabriele, Gabriele, can you please play uh, a role for me? It's not much, it's not much. Just, you know, three, four, maximum one week, but I'm working here. And then I have theater shows in the evening. Don't worry, we shoot in the morning. And that's how I was involved in Nono Sonno. That's how I did my movies with Dario. After shooting Profondo Rosso, In the night I was shooting non, um, Profondo Rosso, Mario Visconti, in Turing, and then maybe in Milan, in Pavia, in Crema. We were shooting with Marco Visconti, and it was a dreadful week. Then the other scenes were shot in Rome. Profondo Rosso is deep red, and uh, Nono Sonno is sleepless in English. But then you also shot some uh, movies as director. Yes, but I went uh, that summer when the movie was released. Uh, my people uh, used to tell me, oh no, but I have to play Henry V, and uh, I was playing that in Verona. Um, they were telling me, well, but this is an important movie but I have Henry V, uh, I have Henry V, I have to do Henry V. Uh, I kept repeating that. Uh, 
And I did Henry V. Very well. Theater is theater, is the life of Gabriele Lave. And now I would like to show picture number 11 because theater also means Luigi Pirandello. Not just because uh, Gabriele Lave is fundamentally is a Sicilian, but uh, well, this is uh, L'Uomo dal Fiore in Bocca. He's showing what uh, is underneath, uh, showing that here is, is the flower, the tumor. It's the man with the flower in his mouth. So, Pirandello, you have addressed Pirandello throughout all your career as an actor, as a director. Now you're preparing I Giganti alla Montagna. Well, Pirandello is the greatest. And it is uh, Italy, Italy known uh, everywhere. It's just in Italy that it was not uh, known. It was a fiasco, uh, the, f the premiere in 1920 with all the characters. Uh, the audience threw coins against uh, him. Uh, he went back home uh, with uh, his daughter and they found a carriage uh, with uh, his daughter through the Nomentana road. Now picture 11, six characters in search of a, an author here. And they threw coins to him, but one year after, uh, a month after, it was a great success in Berlin, in Paris, and New York. But here, they could not understand it. That world liked Nicodemi. Pirandello is an expressionist. He doesn't look with the eyes. He looks with the inner eye. His uh, reality is a distorted reality. We have to look at uh, Grotz's drawing. We have to look at the expressionist world, which in Italy was represented just by Luigi Pirandello. Those uh, humped uh, and bent characters, the ill characters, it is clear that the flower in the mouth is a cancer, but it's the cancer of life. This is the father of the six characters, it's you. Ah, yeah, that's right, because the six characters has a problem, have a problem in their mind, they're all mad. But why was it uh, started in Italy? I mean, Pirandello's theater. Why is it Italy? Why is this? Uh, why did this Italy mark the world? Well, I have a certain idea. It's not totally clear why this gentleman, Luigi Pirandello, who was born in a cultured family and a peculiar family, the father and the mother really had to strive. They did strive. The father took the shoe off Garibaldi's foot, foot when he was wounded. And when he got wounded, Garibaldi sheltered him. And the mother, the same. This uh, kid is born at the time of cholera in Agrigento. So the mother is sent to a town, to a place where they have a house. And this place is called Chaos, a Greek word that means disordered, uh, widely open. And the opposite is cosmos, ordered embellished, cosmetic. Let me tie it up. Let me tie it up myself. My mother would tell me, used to tell me. And this probably 
is something that was uh, established in destiny. Then the father takes care of uh, Solfatara and decides to enroll the son to the Mineral Institute, but secretly he go he goes he enrolls at the Lyceum, classic Lyceum, and uh, he decides to go to Bonn to study. He goes to Bonn and uh, he graduates with a thesis on a linguistics study of the dialects of Agrigento in the Mazara Plain in, the, in Sicily. Mazara refers to a plant, a hallucinogenous plant called the Masarach that grows in that area that brings to ammazzare, to kill somebody. Those who can get the ammazzarach can kill. Such as, as much as hashis becomes assassin. In this uh, weird plane, this weird flat line, where in his work, uh, the giant of the plane would say, there's the voices of the murdered, he wrote this work in German. And clearly, in German, he, in Germany, he is attacked by the expressionist world that is about to rise. But uh, when he goes to Sicily, he says, well, this is all the, uh, similar to the drawings that I saw in Bonn. All my friends are like this. They're all weird, and he understands that he, this is my interpretation, that he has to do expressionist uh, theater. After all, expressionists are afterwards like Verga, who invented verism in the world, that came after realism, that came before naturalism, realism, reality naturalism, nature, intended as being. And after naturalism, there comes not expressionism. There is a Strindberg, then there is a symbolism, then expressionism, then Munk. the inner sight, and Pirandello is a champion, he's a genius, and he is not understood, because in Italy he was performed so badly, but not intentionally. But the idea that people have of Pirandello is through the view, the vision that uh, the Compagnia dei Giovani had uh, Giorgio de Lullo, elegance and liberty, but Pirandello is not like that. P Pirandello's characters are more complex, are more nasty, are more evil. They live uh, badly, they're not comfortable with themselves and with life. They are lurid persons, just like the father of the six characters. He's really a nasty person. He's really despicable. He tries, uh, uh, well, he goes to brothels uh, and uh, he wants uh, his wife uh, to have an intercourse with uh, his employee and he wants to look at them. But So the six characters are terrifying stories. They are distorted stories. They are ill stories. But then he um, 
runs out of money because the solfatara of his uh, father gets uh, flooded and he needs to uh, take the money that were saved for the wife's uh, wedding and he, then he gets in love with her. So this is a sort of a novel of Pirandello. So they had to use the 40,000 lira with which uh, the daughter was sold to Tila, this uh, gentleman who was uh, a violent person. He was a money lenderer and he says, give me the 40,000 lira if your son marries my daughter, this is the money. So he basically wrote, you can do what you want. And then he sees this girl getting out of the, con the convent that was really designed to walk uh, looking at the floor. And there was always somebody checking whether this girl was really looking at the floor. And Pirandello, when he sees her, says, well, she's even beautiful. I will love her. I feel I can love her. And yet, Pirandello in Rome is really understood as a genius and his house is always frequented by great intellectuals, not just Italian ones, and she's always like this. And she was standing like that and one day there was a lot of guests she goes to the ne room next door where there is a piano and nothing can be heard and then at a certain stage a big sound comes from that room well this is a great movie I mean the wife of Luigi Pirandello is a kind of great movie because this poor lady was then sent to a lunatic asylum, but Luigi was against this. But at a certain stage, with a knife, she attacked Luigi. And so there was a family reunion, and then the judge also said that she had to be sent to a lunatic asylum, and uh, Eventually, she was sent to a nursing home and uh, possibly she found uh, some rest in such a terrible life for both of them. He, when the family had to uh, use these 40,000 lira to get the water out of the solfatara, the wife, Antonietta, just fainted. She got paralyzed. And the husband took her, and the wife was so jealous of him, and he was holding, she was holding him like that. He was giving his novels to Travis for free, and when Travis sent him a letter saying, please, please send me some novels, send me some novels, Unfortunately, I can't write for free any longer. I'm really having economic problems. I need to ask you money. Try to send him 7,000 lira for all the tales that he had written before, and 7,000 more to say, this is in, uh, in advance for your novel. Which novel? Nobody knows. The wife is holding her, he is laying down with the sheets of paper, the pen. The only thing that I knew about me, he wrote at night, was this, that my name is Mattia Pascal. Non sapeva capire.
So can you understand it? He didn't he didn't he didn't know anything. And I don't know how to get out of the story of Pirandello because I want to bring you to another great classic that you've taught us. Number 14, Hamlet and Ophelia, right? Gabriele Lavia and Monica Guerritore. In the mid-1980s, uh, that was my third edition of a Hamlet, uh, my third and last edition of uh, Hamlet, uh, you published a book last year in which you explained that if you want to be a contemporary, you need to read the classic books. The classical books. Well, uh, I love classical books. Uh, life is short, and the actor's life is even shorter. So why should you waste your time um, playing silly characters? You have no time. So we go back to the nourishment, to the feeding theater. Uh, Reverend, you're the only one who can understand me. If you need to do one thing, if you need to do one good thing, you cannot postpone it. We always say tomorrow, Hamlet needs to be played now. Um, Othello needs to be played now. Uh, in two years' time, I will not have the strength to stand and to remember all the lines. So why should I waste my time uh, with a modern text? Well, of course, it may be a masterpiece, but this is not the, the period for masterpieces. This is not the right century for masterpieces. It's not the right, it's not the right century. It's like the 1900 in, in, uh, 1800, 18th century in, uh, in the UK. There were no geniuses, but we had Goldoni, and that was a genius. And there was nobody like Goldoni, nobody liked Pirandello. So why should we complain? Why all of a sudden are we surrounded by geniuses uh, who need to be uh, represented at the, in the theater? It, this is not the case. We should come to terms with this. We should face it. Number 15, this is Macbeth. The most recent Macbeth, uh, my, the second edition of Macbeth. As for King Lear, well, everybody plays really Lear. Everybody plays King Lear. And with no shame. Uh, recently, uh, recently I, I knew there were versions of King Lear um, we, uh, which uh, are, which were outrageous. So you need to play King Lear after playing Macbeth, Hamlet, Henry V. You cannot start by playing King Lear. Uh, it's, it's a fart of King Lear. And not properly played. You need to be, to have a little bit of shame. So it's, it's difficult, it's a task to, uh, to play a classical role. Uh, it is a task each time you decide to play an important text or an important role. You, it, it's not beautiful to play Hamlet or Henry V or Macbeth. Uh, it's sort of an anguish, because you're always into contact with your power, powerlessness. Uh, I need, now I need to say it tomorrow, tomorrow you crawl uh, from one day to the other until your last syllable, which time can uh, record. And all of our yesterdays only served to enlighten uh, the way to death made of uh, dust. Uh, turn off short candle. Life is a shadow walking. A poor actor shaking, sweating, shouting on the stage for his time. It doesn't mean anything. It, it's not a joke. 
It creates anguish. But can you realize what was written by Shakespeare? Why should we complain? Because we have no other genius like Shakespeare. Shakespeare was one, one and only. He was a genius. Pirandello is not like us, was not like us. Shakespeare is not like us. Uh, he, he was like Sophocles, Euripides. It's, it's not by chance that we have so few geniuses who are still uh, played uh, today. Euripides, the, the cursed one. who wrote, I didn't know what a lie was until I um, heard a Greek speaking. 25,000 Greek spectators. So this is why Euripides was not so loved. Well, I, I need to say this, this is moving. Aeschylus was 47 years and he uh, took part in the Salamina battle against the Persians. The Greek, the Greeks won. Aeschylus was already um, an appreciated uh, author of, theatri of uh, th uh, theatrical texts. He returned home and he wrote after a couple, after, the, after two years, the Persians from the side of the Persians the enemies of, Greek, of Greece, and he spoke about the Persians, uh, and he was full of pity and mercy towards their defeat. So what are we talking about? Now I'm going to blackmail you. Uh, this is the this is a picture of uh, uh, her name is Lucia and she is your daughter. She's not as Argento. She's a, uh, a beautiful Italian actress. My daughter is a son. She's something else. She's a different thing. So your, your pathway is continuing with Lorenzo, Lucia. They're also actors. Lorenzo is a different thing. Lorenzo is a very, very good actor. And is also becoming a very, very good uh, director. Lucia uh, is a son. She, she's totally different from myself and from her mother. Nobody knows. Why? Nobody knows it. So this is Italy. This is the, this is the Italy which goes forward. Unfortunately, uh, it is unhappy. But maybe. But it would have everything to be happy, but it is unhappy, unfortunately. Il nostro e forse per questo è brava, eh? Potrebbe anche essere. Uh, and my daughter also has, has everything to be happy and she's unhappy. Uh, and she's very, very good. This is the, the dream of the ridiculous man. This is the last picture. I would very much like... This is a sort of a, um, a couple of fragments. Or it is uh, another translation. This is a, a, a great um, short story by Dostoevsky. And this is a recent uh, um, play by uh, Gabriele Lavia. Well, Dostoevsky, as you know, is a giant. He understood that the only way to come out of the absolute nihilism in which uh, mankind 
was stuck, well, there was one only way, uh, the way of Christ. But Dostoevsky's Christ is not the Christ of the religious faith. Uh, it is a Christ that you meet. For instance, there are many images of the Christ. The one I love most is in the memories of the subsoil. At a certain point, there's a character uh, running to a brother. He has been offended. And he, to have revenge, he wants to pay a woman. And he passes um, in front of a brothel. It is the uh, New Year's Eve. The uh, brothers, the brothers' door is open, and outside, um, in the middle of the snow, there's a prostitute, um, naked. Uh, it's a brothel for poor people. One of these people who is throwing uh, snowballs to her gets back to the brothel to take a herring. And he goes to her and he puts a herring in her hands, probably uh, saying swear words or bad words to her. And this woman... Um, who has uh, some teeth missing, she lifts the fish and screams. Three lines. Yet, but f for Dostoevsky, uh, there is this man who wants to uh, do some to harm a prostitute by paying her, only offending her, by paying her and offending her and her body. And for just a moment, he sees a Christ, the woman, the a human being being violated, bleeding with a symbol, with a fish in her hand. And he describes her, just three words, but three words written by Dostoevsky. It's like, um, it's like Van Gogh painting. And so this, uh, the dream of a ridiculous man is the, uh, the story of my life. I read it for the first time when I was 17, then I, when I was 18 I read it again to some of my uh, friends, so my friends, some, some of my companions, a group of friends. I, I was living in Turin then, I was uh, uh, going to school in Turin, uh, uh, but we liked to go to concerts, so we, we read books, so we were, we, we were, we were uh, lunatics. Uh, for, this, for those times, because we like theatre, we like reading. Then one day, uh, Menotti, who invented the Spoleto Festival, uh, said to me, Gabriele, would you like to do something in Spoleto? And I said, okay, I will, I will play the dream of a ridiculous man. So I uh, imagined uh, uh, a play. I had two assistants, Franco, who is the director of the uh, Trieste's uh, Teatro Stabile, and Luca Barbareschi. He was very young then. He had, he was a voluntary assistant. He was 17, and he was the assistant for the Henry V for me, uh, which I played after Deep Red, after acting in Deep Red. Um, Luca was very, very, very nice. 
very amusing. So I, I, I couldn't do it. And so I decided to to flee. I, I wanted to escape because I, I knew I couldn't do it. And I, I didn't have the courage to, to tell the director. I was rehearsing in the Eliseo Theatre. I, I ran up I ran down the stairs and I wanted to, to escape, to flee. It was the day in which the uh, poor uh, boy fell into the well in the early 1980s. I remember I got home and I saw this uh, accident uh, on TV. And so he took me uh, again uh, and, and he told me, no, I, I, will, I will have you learn it by heart. Luca said it. Luca has changed a lot since then. Although I still love him uh, as my one of my uh, dearest friends, he had me uh, learn it by heart, learn the part by heart. It was one of the last uh, short stories written by Dostoevsky, seven, eight years before he died. I don't remember the date now. However, he was the director of a, a literary. Um, magazine called Il Cittadino, The Citizen. He wrote this short story along with others. And that was the notes. He's coming out of the, of the underground. So notes from the underground. The underground, the condition of the spirit in which the man isolates himself from the other man and he lives uh, uh, just like a rat, like a cockroach, hating all the others, despi uh, despising all the others uh, profoundly because they lack um, sensitivity uh, and he never accepts the others. Of course, this is a ridiculous man. I am a ridiculous man. Uh, I am called uh, a lunatic and that would be, and that would be uh, something, uh, something of an improvement. So he tells about uh, a dream, this man leaving uh, hating the others, and he's stopped by a Christ at a certain point. In this case, um, a little girl stopping him. And he wrote, um, I was grabbed by my elbow by a five-year-old little girl. Um, she was wet with a red cloth, and uh, her shoes were also wet. I still remember them. I had noted them. She had started to run um, on my side and she was calling her mommy. But I didn't follow her. He didn't follow her. Instead, he uh, wanted to treat her bad. And indeed, as those men in front of the brothel throwing snowballs to the prostitute, he, the ridiculous man, well, started to scream, to shout against, uh, towards this little girl. And she simply answered, Sir, sir. And she left him, she crossed the street, then there were other passers-by, and she had left him to run to him. So he uh, goes home, he falls asleep, and he dreams. He dreams, and he decides to commit suicide. He had bought a beautiful uh, US um, revolver. But in the meantime, he kept thinking about that little girl. And that was an annoying memory, and he feels bad because he um, treated the little girl bad. He falls asleep, and he dreams about killing himself. Then he dreams about himself in the grave, and he dreams about the irony of the uh, guilt and of the punishment. A, a drop of water on the left eye shot at every minute of interval and so he he decides to uh, 
uh, he decides to go against this because he has decided to kill himself and then you get your revenge with us with a stupid useless existence while I'm here in the grave with one drop of water then the drop of water stops the the tomb the grave opens the coffin opens and a black uh, a man with a black uh, coat takes him away and they find themselves in the space out in the other space and he sees another another son the same of us as our son so if there's another son uh, where is the other earth and the the man indicates points at another at another earth where the man who knows no evil lives uh, in the second earth everybody lives happily nobody knows uh, nothing about the lies uh, the kids are the kids of everybody everybody's happy and so he's astonished and he starts adoring men then he said I perverted them all as an atom of plague infecting all the states I infected them all because I taught them how to lie they love the lies they knew the beauty of the lies it started as a joke maybe it started from an atom but then the atom of lie seducted those hearts and then lies generated sensuality then jealousy then jealousy generated cruelty I don't know how but uh, in a short period of time the first bloodshed uh, was there so in two lines Dostoevsky tells about the entire history of mankind that in the end when he was trying desperately to say to those men that they that they had ruined themselves and stating it's my fault finally he saw the suffering in the faces of this man and they said that suffering is beauty because only in suffering uh, there is a sense so I, I walked um, among them and I finally love them I love them more than I love them when they were innocent and beautiful I love their earth uh, which had been profanated more than when it was a heaven only because suffering had finally appeared and pain had finally appeared on that land I had always loved pain but only for me for the others I cried and I, and I told them that I was the one who had done all that. I was the one who had infected them all with the lies. And I, um, I begged them to crucify me. I taught them how you can make a, uh, a cross. To crucify me. A cross? Yes, a cross. On my earth, every man knows how to make the cross but then they started to laugh at me they started to say that I was uh, a little bit weird uh, that it, it was a case for me to change my tone otherwise uh, they would put me into a mental um, institution at the time he wakes up he sees the revolver the gun the candle on the table um, has almost turned off so he wakes up he stands up and he decides to live and he decides to preach to talk with the others he decides that he wants to preach and to talk to other people and he wants to preach truth because he has seen truth men can be innocent and beautiful beautiful and happy without losing their ability to live on the earth I don't want and I cannot believe that the evil 
is the normal state of man. This is what the clever people do not understand. This is a hallucination, a delirium, a dream. And they take pride in this. Uh, life is not a dream. And in the meantime, it is so easy, so simple. In one single day, in one single hour, in a single moment, everything would be in order. Love the others as you love yourself. This is it. Everything is here. You don't need anything else. And all of a sudden, you will find the way to behave properly and justly with your neighborhood, with your neighbor. How? Well, this is an old, an ancient truth. It has been said one million times. It's been repeated one million times. It's been read one million times. But it has never really rooted. The knowledge of the laws of uh, happiness is superior to happiness. This is what we need to fight against. And I will fight. And everything will finally be in order. But everybody needs to want this. Gabriele Lavia. So we must, we must run. So Reverend, you've, for, you've forgiven me. We are uh, sorry, but we're running out of time. I would like to remind you of something. This year, it is possible to contribute to uh, donate to the meeting. In the exhibition halls, you will find some desks with a red heart. Uh, you can donate only at the dedicated desks where you find the volunteers wearing uh, the uh, uh, magenta colored uh, uh, t-shirts. Thank you very much, Gabriele Lavia.